If you will, turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 12. And I want us just to center in for just a moment as we introduce our subject on Exodus chapter 12, verse 26, in which was read for us just a moment ago, and verse 25. It was in the midst of the time when the children of Israel were in Egypt, and we were coming upon what we know as that final plague. God has shown his superiority over all of the Egyptian gods. But there was one act to be left to be shown. Before that happened, though, there were some questions. Center in with me in Exodus 12, verse 25. And for emphasis, we'll read it again, just as it was read so well before. And it shall come to pass when you come to the land which the Lord will give you, according as he has promised that ye shall keep this service. And it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? That you shall say it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses. And the people bowed the head and worshipped. They wanted nothing more than to leave Egypt. They had been in bondage for a number of years and it was time to go. But just as you know and I know, Pharaoh of Egypt said no. Nine different times God has showed his superiority over Pharaoh, over the people of Egypt, and over all the little g-gods of Egypt. And right before that tenth plague, the death of the firstborn, the question comes. The children will say, what mean ye by this service? And I love the depiction that was given there in the passage. Then ye shall say, We've been spending time in the month of February on our homes. We've been talking about that wonderful topic of love. We've been spending time talking about our marriages. Uh, Practically, the last three sermons have been on marriage. Uh, But for this particular sermon, I want to center in on something that's a little deeper. I I want to center in on the home. Because I think when we look at the word love, which is the theme for the month, we see the home. And there are many variations in the home by size and, and, and by different other factors. But there's something that inhabits the home that has to be in every home. And it was hit on some of the topics in Christian Servants Day, and I debated on changing whether we were going to discuss this or not because this topic was briefly mentioned. But I think we need to. Because I think we need to understand it's that important. What we're getting ready to discuss is that important. And in reality, we could spend every Sunday on the same subject and in a different means and it would be that important because it's worth all of our time it's worth all of our energy and it's worth everything that we have I have an easy way to show you what I mean without saying what I'm trying to say and it's an easy illustration and you'll get it this book It's the most important thing that exists. Not just for a marriage. Not just for a congregation of God's people. It's important for the home. Because in this book are answers to questions like we're asked in Exodus chapter 12. What mean ye by this service? And God gave them the answer. This service is because he led us out of Egypt. And because he passed over our homes in that great final plague that was upon Egypt, and he spared the houses of Israel. 
What do you say when you go home and your child asks you, what, what did that service mean? Why, why, why do we go to Bible class? Why do we go on Wednesday night? What's your answer? The answer is because God made it possible for us to spend eternity with Him. And that's why we're concerned about this book. I want us to spend just a, a little bit of time this morning in the book of Proverbs and in various other areas looking at some ideas about the family. Here's the very first point. We need to teach our families. Uh, go with me to the book of Proverbs and start with me in chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. And let's see the emphasis is being made. We're going to look at a couple of passages, three passages, and we'll cite another passage in the book of Proverbs to lay the foundation of teaching our families. In Proverbs chapter 4, I want you to notice verse 1. Hear, ye children, the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding. Go with me to Proverbs chapter 5, and I want you to look at verse 7. Hear me now, therefore, O ye children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Proverbs chapter 7 verse 24 carries with it the same principle as Proverbs chapter 5 does in verse 7. We read in Proverbs 7 verse 24, Hearken unto me now, therefore, O ye children. And attend to the words of my mouth. If you move over to Proverbs chapter 8 and you move down to verse 32. Now therefore hearken unto me, O ye children. For blessed are they that keep my ways. There's an interesting principle and in play on words that happens in the book of Proverbs. And in the passages in which we've just noted four of them. It's talking about a father who is in the Lord instructing his children on how to act in the Lord and how to behave themselves as someone who follows the Lord. Now we can illustrate it in the same way we did just a moment ago. It's someone who teaches the principles found and that originate from the Almighty God. There are a lot of things that I want Charlie to know. This is the best one. There are a lot of things I want him to know. This is the best. This is all we have. And I make a plea with you right now. Make this a priority. There are so many things that we could be involved in. And, and, and Kelly and I have already been discussing what sport Charlie's going to play. We have no clue. But I don't care. this teaching our families begins with God's words and that's the instructions that the book of Proverbs begins to do and anything we do in life is especially critical Ephesians chapter 5 verses 15 through 16 tells us to redeem the time because that's a wise thing that's a good thing to do it says, see that you work, walk circumspectly not as fools but as wise redeeming the time because the days are evil I've asked myself many times from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 and 16, what is the best way we can redeem the time? What is the best way I can use my time? What is the best thing I can do for my family? Because that's what I read in that passage. I need to redeem the time for those that are around me. What's the best thing I can do? I'll illustrate it again just as I did a moment ago. It's the best thing we can do. Now I know that's very profoundly simple. And I know it's easy for me to stand here and hold up this book because you know what it is. And I know it's easy for us to hold this book and say, this is what we pattern our lives after. That's the easy part. Doing it's the hard part. But doing it is also the rewarding part. Think about this for just a moment. Think about eternity. I can tell you the people that I want to see in eternity. Now that doesn't mean I don't want to see you in eternity. But I can list the two people that are at the top of that list. 
And I think you know who they are. One's a little boy named Charlie, and the other's the best woman in this world named Kelly. Men, the priority should be in our homes is God's Word. And there's nothing more foundational in which we should redeem the time with because the days are evil than God's words. We need to use every opportunity we have. Opportunities to train. Opportunities to instruct. Opportunities to instill godly principles that will never leave them. You know, we have to be prepared. I've been interested at at things children ask. And I love to, to, to get on the internet. If you don't do this, maybe you should sometime. But get on YouTube and Google or search the question, funny things children say. Or funny questions children ask. They're very profound. And what I've found is some of the things that children ask are the same things that you and I ask. When children start talking about God, who is He? What has He done? Do you know what people ask adults? Who is He? What has He done? When children talk about eternity, how long is that? Where is it going to be? That's the same questions you and and I ask. The Apostle Peter exhorts exhorts us to be ready on any question. And in our families, whether it's the children, whether it's us asking questions of ourselves, we need to be prepared right here. I can tell you how to calculate the lens you will need for a commercial-sized film projector based on the screen size that you have. I used to say math was never going to to teach me anything in life until one day I finally used one of those equations that you were taught in school to learn how to do that. I can tell you how to do that. Some of you can tell us how to fix things. Some of you can tell us some wonderfully amazing things. Can you tell people about God? Can, Can you go home today and tell your family about the Lord? Can you tell about his wonderful blessedness, his rich grace, his rich mercy, and his rich salvation? Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter 3.15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and in fear. When we start to talk about the topic of teaching our families, it begins, ladies and gentlemen, with us as individuals I love to hear him do that that means something to me it may be distracting to you but it means something to me before I walked up that's what he was doing patting the Bible he learned to do that recently I hope he always wants this book And I hope as we sit here this morning and we're thinking about teaching our families, I hope we understand this is the most important thing we have. I'm going to repeat that as many times as I can this morning. This is the most important thing we have. All the clothes, all of the toys, all of the things. You should see our living room. It's a toy explosion. But that's not what is important. The Lord is. Under the law of Moses, parents were required to teach their children. I love the depiction in Exodus chapter 12, 26 and 27. And the same thing being depicted in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 18 through 20. Uh, listen to this. Therefore shall you lay up these my words in your heart and your soul and bind them for a sign upon your hand, that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall teach them your children, speaking of them when thou sittest down in the house, when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt write them on the doorpost of thy house and upon thy gates. What's the point of Deuteronomy 11, 18 through 20? This is everywhere. The point is when we teach our families, this is a priority. I want Charlie to be smarter than I am. It won't take much. I want him to be smarter than me. But I want it to start right here. I hope he goes to college. 
I hope he becomes educated. I hope he's smart. And I hope he knows who the Lord is. Teaching our families, which brings us into one particular thought we need to explore. Everybody in the family is included. Everyone in the family is included. You know, children are not the only ones that need to learn. Uh, we need to learn. Garland Elkins has the most profound statement in the world. And he states that the greatest room in his life is the room for improvement. Now, if you don't know who Garland Elkins is, you'll usually see him quoting the Bible like this, upside down, because you can see the little marker. He'll never open it. Because it's just like Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 18 through 20. It's on his heart and it's upon his soul and he just goes. 1 Peter 3, 7 says, Husbands are to dwell with their wives according to knowledge. We need to sit down together, men, women, and focus on this book. All the instructions that the Word of God gives us is for making our marriages to work and for making them to be important. 1 Peter 3, 7 says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. What's the idea? What's the concept? The concept is about honor, and it's about being an heir together. Marriage is not just about this earth, but it has an eternal idea, being heirs together. You know, husbands that dwell in knowledge must know who their wives are, and wives who dwell in knowledge with their husbands must know who their husbands are, and husbands and wives that dwell in knowledge together must know who their children are. There's a principle at play here. We need to know who each other are. We need to know who we are as individuals. We need to know who our family is. We need to know who we are. You know, in the world, our world depicts that we should be whatever we want to be. We should have whatever we want to have. We should do what we, what we want to do. We should be with whomever we want to be. We should be happy. There's no happiness in this world like is found in this book. I know you know that. I'm not saying that because I discovered it this morning and I thought it was something that was neat. We need to be reminded when we talk about studying with our families and everyone being included that this is it. I told you I was going to find a, a way to say that as many times as I can. This is all we have. If every book in the world were destroyed, this would be the most vital book. Because without this document... This living and breathing document by God. We're alone. Everyone has to be included. Husbands, wives, children, family members, whomever it may be. You know, we, we describe families in many different ways in our world. And, and we have what I like to call extended families. Adopted families. You know, maybe it's time we include that into our concept of this discussion. There are other individuals that need to be studied with and need studying together. Why don't we do that? Not because we want to stand superior in knowledge, but because we want to love our Lord. So everyone has to be involved. But there's something that has to happen above all of these things that really becomes a priority in what we're discussing this morning. Go with me to Proverbs chapter 9. Proverbs chapter 9. One more point and the lesson will be yours. Proverbs chapter 9, and I want you to go down to verse 9. Proverbs 9, verse 9. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. We need to increase in learning. And I want you to understand the concept that's happening in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 9. It's an individual thing. 
You know, everyone's involved, but we need to be doing something else. We need to be teaching ourselves. We need to be spending time with ourselves in this book. You can't start to teach a family if you don't know this book. You can't dwell according to knowledge with your wife, with your spouse, if you do not know this book. You cannot dwell in knowledge at all without this book. The wise man must heed instruction to be pleasing to God. Much is said about the qualification of elders and the qualifications of deacons. And much is said about what preachers should be. But what about instructors in the home? Many of the qualifications in which were discussed of preachers comes from Paul's discourse in Timothy to Titus. Of course, where the instructions of elders and deacons as well come. But think of these instructions here. Uh, 1 Timothy 1, 3-4. Charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies. Here's something we can do in our family studies and in our individual studies. We make sure we teach no other doctrine. We stay with the book. Rule number one of teaching yourself and teaching your family and teaching with your spouse, you stay with the book. Rule number two comes from 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. Be an example to the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Number one rule, number two rule for teaching this book right here, be an example. Be an example. Titus chapter 1 verses 9 through 13 teaches us the same thing that goes along with 1 Timothy 1, 3, and 4. Things pertaining to sound teachings. Not just sticking with the book only, but making sure we're applying this book as it's meant to be applied. Titus chapter 2, verses 7 and 8 says we need to show ourselves as a model of good works. We need to be good works. Much is said about those in which are instructing in God's Word. And the type of study that's being found is found, it should be Bible-based uh, one of my favorite passages is, is a passage that many of you are familiar with. It's a passage that sits in the floor of the Memphis School of Preaching, 2 Timothy 4, 2. And it gives us the answer to everything we're trying to figure out right now. When we're talking about teaching ourselves, preach, speak, herald, proclaim the word. These are not my words. Of course, I'm speaking words right now. But I didn't come up with any of these principles and concepts and ideas. God set them into motion. And God set them into printed page, we could say. Paul did not tell him to live by psychology, materialistic ideas, traditions in which exist in our world, but he told him as he begins to go out spreading the gospel to speak the words of of God. Now, if it was important for young Timothy to do that, how important is it for you and me? We ask the question, why? Because only when the Word of God is preached can men be saved, according to passages like Romans 1.16, 1 Corinthians 1.18, and James 1.21. Only when the words of God are preached can men know what God's needs or can men know what they need to do to be appeasing to God husbands wives children grandparents grandfathers grandmothers extended families God's word needs to be in our lives and it starts with you and it starts with me the study of God must be plain and it must be simple and it must be able to be understood. I've tried to emphasize three things this morning. Number one, we need to be placing this book as a priority in our families. And you know just as much as I do, a family is when a couple is married. Whether you have children or not, we need to be placing this as a priority in our lives. And you understand just as much as I do if you're single, if you're not married, you're a part of a family. And you need to be placing this word just as much as in, in your life as we need to in ours. I've tried to demonstrate that everyone in the family should be involved in this. 
And I'm trying to explain that as we begin this process, we have to do it for ourselves. Remember, we need to be Bible-based. We need to be plainly spoken. We need to be Christ-centered. And we have to begin this at home. Proverbs 20, verse 7 says this, The just man walketh in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. I hope that you make in your life a priority to study God's Word together. I enjoy Bible studies because we get to gather together as a group of people and study God's Word. I enjoy worship time not only because we can ascribe praise, honor, and glory unto the Almighty God, but because we get to be inside of His words. And we get to do so together. Maybe the case this morning that you're not a child of God. I want to encourage you one thing. And I'm going to do so with an example which you've seen a handful of times. If you're not a child of God this morning, in this book, and in this book alone, God's word is the answer to sin by hearing his words, believing them, repenting of your past sins, which means change, confessing the name of Jesus, and then being immersed in water, which I assure you this morning is right in front of you and right behind me. You can do that this morning. You can become his child. You can become a part of the family of God, and you can begin to study this book and be in eternity with the Lord. Maybe the case this morning that you are a child of God and you stepped away from the Lord for whatever reason. It may be that you failed your family in study. It may be that you've done something else that's unacceptable unto God. Whatever it may be. The book of James tells us if we can confess our faults one to another, the good, righteous, almighty God will forgive us. And now we're at one of my favorite times in the worship assembly. The invitation song has been picked out. It's been prepared in your minds. And here we are. Then this is going to lead us if you have a need, why don't you respond as together we stand and sing? When peace like a 